what I see in the industry at the moment is that there is a lot of, let's say, hype around event-driven architectures, uh, around reactive architectures, especially in the microservice community. And very often you see metaphors like that, slides like that, as a metaphor for these event-driven architectures, like a ballet, like a dance, a beautiful dance. And it works like, because every of these dancers know the rules, how the overall dance should look like, um, you probably can simply just add another dancer and it will be a beautiful thing to look at, like with the microservices where you can add another microservice and it will be part of the game and it will be beautiful. And it's actually not what I'm seeing in real life. It's not what I see with the customers um, I'm talking about, I'm discussing about um, this kind of architecture. So there's a big gap of what we try to achieve and what we sometimes get the impression that it's easy to achieve these days and what's reality. And that motivated me to give this talk where I really want to dive into what's the advantages of current of event driven systems, what's the, let's say, the risks or the pitfalls you should probably avoid. And if I want to talk about orchestration and choreography, I thought I'd start with a very boring thing of defining the terms, um, which is actually not as boring as it sounds, because if you search for that, and that's what I did, if you search for that, you will probably stumble upon that article on Stack Overflow. It's relatively, um, relatively famous, at least. It's pretty good ranked at Google, at least in my Google bubble. Um, and somebody asked, like, what's the difference between service orchestration and choreography? like from an intra-organization point of view. So you're looking at microservices within your company. Okay. So that's a pretty good question, right? And if you look through the answer, and just to give you that hint immediately, I don't think it's a good answer. I don't think it's the right answer, but it expresses very well the answer. Um, a lot of people think, or that's more or less the conception most people have around service orchestration and choreography. So I want to go through it very quickly. And somebody writes, service orchestration is um, a single centralized executable business process, and that's the orchestrator responsible for invoking other services, right? This, this, and I literally hear the term like the central spider in the web relatively often for orchestration. There's this one central single endpoint that, that does all the things and orchestrates all the other services, okay? Um, just again, as a heads up, I'm coming back to that. As a heads up, very important. I don't agree with that definition. Totally not. I think it's a, we, we need to define it very differently, but I come back to that in a second. Let's look at choreography for a second. And in the same article, the same person basically says, okay, service choreography is a global description of the participating services. Um, that's kind of a fuzzy description, right? But um, that's what I said earlier with the dance, rules of interaction and agreement. So we have certain yeah, behavior everybody agrees on and that's why it works. And that means the choreography differs from orchestration with respect to where the logic that controls the interaction resides. So we don't have, and that's kind of in between the lines, we don't have anything central. They're just talking to each other, okay? And that's kind of what I see a lot people thinking about service orchestration and choreography. And let's make an example and let's try to apply this definition to that example. So I'm always doing auto fulfillment examples because I, I, I found that most people can relate to that. So let's assume you're a mail order company and Amazon, Zalando and whatever. And then you might come up with a couple of microservices like a checkout microservice to um, people can place orders, a payment microservice to collect money, an inventory microservice to yeah, manage inventory and a shipment microservice to um, create the parcels and send it out of the door, right? Now, in order to implement such an, um, such an order fulfillment process, I mean, one approach you could take, and again, I'm not saying that's a good approach necessarily, I'll come back to that in a second, but one approach you could take is you could use REST synchronous REST calls, right? So you could say the checkout microservice calls a REST API on the payment service, say, hey, somebody ordered, so payment does retrieve payment and then directly calls the next service in the row, um, synchronous REST with a, uh, like book everything out of inventory, um, ship it and so on and so forth. And these synchronous call chains, they are pretty evil, right? There, there, there are a lot of problems with these synchronous call chains, which you can also see in a lot of microservice scenarios um, because they're 
like they're blocking. Um, so if one of the services is not available, the whole thing is not available, they add a lot of latency because you have to wait for all the services to do their work. Um, they're probably not good at, at utilizing all the resources because most of the threads are basically waiting and so on and so forth. So you shouldn't do these synchronous call chains for these scenarios. That's kind of not a new information, right? But we need that piece, uh, the puzzle piece later on, okay? So you don't, probably don't want to do a synchronous call chain. You probably want to do asynchronous communication because that mitigates a lot of these problems where um, if you send a message to payment doing something and then payment relays the message to the next one like inventory and so on and so forth, you're not dependent on the availability. If payment is not, not there, um, the message will wait in the queue until payment become available, right? And so on and so forth. And you're not blocking any threat. Um, so this is by far a better approach than the synchronous um, communication here. Now, interesting question. Let's test our definition of orchestration and choreography. What is that? Like on the left-hand side, the synchronous call chain, is that choreography or orchestration? Same question for the asynchronous um, communication on the right-hand side. And the thing is, if you look at the definition you, you found on um, Stack Overflow earlier on, it's actually very hard to decide because some parts of it, like, okay, the like different microservices communicate directly with each other. I mean, that's part of this chain and this chain as well. So um, somehow it seems to be choreography, right? And there's nothing central. On the other hand, if you remove the central that single endpoint, the centralized. If you remove that from the definition, which you definitely should, it's nothing central. I, I come back to that later on. What it basically said is that you have one service coordinating the other. And if you look at the word orchestration, it's also, you can replace that with coordination in a way. So if one service coordinates the other, which is very true for that example, again, because payment coordinates inventory. Right, checkout coordinates payment. So it seems to be orchestration as well. And that's actually interesting because now we can, you can have basically both for this example, which gives you a good hint that the definition doesn't work. In order to get closer to the essence of it, you have to add event-driven communication to the mix. So far we did asynchronous communication, but um, that's basically, I would say kind of a technical um, thing we do here, like instead of using a blocking REST call, we use a message, so we are not bound to the availability of the service. But event-driven um, adds a couple of other things. So with event-driven communication, it works like this. Different microservices emit certain events, like checkout says, hey, somebody placed an order. That's an event. Hello world, something has happened, right? It's an information that something has happened. It's not... Uh, assuming that anything will, will, will happen because of that event. It's just like, hey, this happened, or payment was received, or goods were fetched, right? So um, all of these microservices could embed events probably to a central event bus. Right? And then other services could subscribe to that and say, hey, I'm, I'm a notification service. My responsibility, my duty is to send notifications to the customer, emails, like, hey, we got your order. Hey, we got your payment. Your parcel is on the way. And that's actually, in this case, it's a great architecture because um, now you have uh, basically put all the logic around notification in one place, which is the notification service, right? So you, you didn't spread it among all the other microservices. Um, you don't have to think about when to send emails within the payment microservice. So that's a good thing. That's event-driven uh, communication. And that's an important part of choreography. Come back to that. Now, what I see happening very often is that, okay, event notifications, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a good tool. Let's use it for everything, like with every good tool. Like, um, so what I see happening is what I call event chains. Um, so in order to implement even the, the, the business process of order fulfillment, like from somebody order till everything is shipped, um, you could implement that using events or event notifications. So you could say like, Somebody ordered something. Okay, that's interesting. Now payment subscribes to it and says, okay, I'm interested in that. I collect the money and emit another event. 
So I eventually could listen to that and say, ah, okay, if you receive the payment, I now basically fetch the goods, uh, emit another event, and then shipment could subscribe to that and so on and so forth. Right. So this implements the business process by a chain of event notifications. Um, <laughs> now, what you can see happening is that this is done a lot, actually. I've seen that with a lot of customers uh, over the yeah, recent month or the last two or three years. Um, you even see people talking about that publicly. So this is um, Phil Calzado um, talking about what they did at Meetup last year at the QCon New York. And he said, okay, we had a lot of event driven mechanisms and we were suffering from pinball machine architecture. And I think that's a good metaphor for this kind of event driven systems because I mean, I made my own slide on that. So it's basically that you throw in something, some trigger, some event, and then it, dun -dun -dun -dun, it bounces through the system and it's, it's emergent behavior. It's not always easy um, to know in advance what will happen. You recognize that by systems where, where people have some kind of incident and then like ask like, this cannot happen in our system. How, how, how? We, we never implemented that, right? So that's emergent behavior. It's hard to understand sometimes, right? I have to do that one time more. I love the animation. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. So um, these event chains, they, they are a big risk. Um, my... I mean, the obvious thing is you don't see what's happening. So you cannot look into one of the microservices, look at the implementation and, and see what's happening overall. No, you have to look at all the services, uh, have to understand their event subscriptions in order to basically to um, yeah, redesign the flow or, or understand the flow. You could also look at the runtime behavior of the system, like inspecting all the events flowing around and probably correlate that back to, to uh, what's happening here. But both is pretty tricky, to be honest. And my hypothesis, um, why so many products currently end up there is the following. It's easy to get started. So if you start with an event-driven architecture and you probably add your event bus, and you add your first microservice, which probably emits, let's say, two events, right? That's easy, <laughs> of course, you just start it. Um, adding the next service is very easy because now you can probably consume like event B, do something and emit event C, and you don't even have to talk to the people doing microservice A. And that's kind of, that feels very decoupled, right? It's, it, it's a good feeling, I could just, develop that service. I, I don't even have to talk to them. They don't have to do any change. They don't have to um, redeploy anything. I'm really, really flexible. And as long as I keep adding things, like the next microservice, probably consuming a couple of these events and so on and so forth. So as soon or as long as you're only adding things, that's very easy. And the problem typically starts as soon as you want to um, change things which normally starts with understanding what's happened. That's, I just tackled, but also probably changing things like probably you have to remove event B or probably you have to understand the chain in order to change the sequence of things and so on and so forth. And that gets really, really hard. I have an example in a minute. So I'm currently seeing that as kind of a kind of technical depth. So I saw a couple of examples where, for example, a startup, they, they went into that understanding this, saying, okay, but we need to buy us a shorter time to value. So we need to be fast in the beginning to really bring something to market. And we know that this might cause some trouble in the long run, but if you don't do it, we will die before we get to a good system. So that's fine. If you do that consciously, I'm, I'm totally happy with, it, with, with, the, with having these pure choreographies um, for that reason, but you should be aware of that risk. That's very important. And most products I see are, are not. Right. It's, it's kind of technical depth because here, if you do the example of just exchanging sequences, like, hey, fetch the items first and then do the payment. And there, um, it's probably not the best business example of the world here, but I see that happening in a lot of other examples where you really have to adjust um, sequences or do things in parallel or really have has to adjust the business process 
behind. If you want to do this, um, you basically have to change all the microservices here. So inventory no longer listens to payment received, but order placed. Payment no longer listens to order placed, but goods fetched, goods shipped. Uh, shipment no longer listens to goods fetched, but um, payment received. So you have to change all the three services here. And you not only have to adjust them, you have to redeploy them in a coordinated fashion. So more or less all at the same time, more or less, or at least you have to think about versioning because if an order is flowing around here, you have to know if it's paid or not. And you cannot get around all the versioning problems, but now you have a distributed versioning problems um, affecting different microservices with different teams. That's exactly not what you want to have when you go with microservices. You want to want to be able to make local changes, right? And that's the big, big problem of these event chains and pure choreographies. For me now to, and I come back to that, I see use case for both, by the way, for event-driven uh, choreography and orchestration. But in order to, to understand better what, what is used in which situation, um, an important thought, and it's very obvious, <laughs> I find that very obvious, is to think about responsibility or accountability. So if you assume a company like um, Salando or Amazon, and they do order fulfillment, um, they, I mean, that's kind of the core business. So they're pretty interested in that running smoothly. So a CEO or a CIO or whatever, um, they might want to ask somebody, hey, are we doing good? Why aren't we doing good? Why is the delivery time so high? Um, whatever. So they want to have one person being responsible for that. Right. And one person being approachable for that. In a microservice world, that normally translates to you want to have one microservice, one team caring about that whole functionality of order fulfillment. Because otherwise, you don't have that one person. You have a ping pong of events going on and nobody being accountable for the whole um, order fulfillment here, which is a big problem, like responsibility-wise. You can't blame anybody. I mean, blame is kind of the negative word, but you can see it in a positive way. Like nobody is accountable for that. So I find it very natural to have something like order fulfillment here as a microservice. And then um, an important thought is like, you can have events in that architecture. So probably order places an event. It's on the bus, order fulfillment subscribes to it. That's fine. But now order fulfillment is responsible and held accountable for fulfilling orders. And if they send out orders that are not paid, they get the blame, they get a problem, right? So they are really interested that the payment happens at the right time. So they, they can't let that emerge out of some kind of events that you send around. Um, they now want to control that. They want to coordinate that and say, okay, the first thing we do is retrieve the payment. And then we retrieve inventory and then we probably ship the stuff. And for me, that's now the essence of the definition and of the difference of choreography and orchestration. So the one thing is I'm, I have event-driven communication and that's choreography. I let it emerge, right? I react to some event. But the other one is orchestration for me is command-driven communication. So I want something, I have an intent, hey, payment now, collect money for me, right? And that's for me the essence of choreography and orchestration. That's my definition. I have, yeah, I have it here. So orchestration for me is command-driven communication. Choreography is event-driven communication, which is, I mean, you don't find any definition in a textbook. Um, that's the one I now use. It's unfortunately not the one most people are thinking of. Most people are thinking of the definition I had in the beginning on Stack Overflow, which I try to change with the talk a little bit. The important thing is it's not about technology, totally not. So you can put an event um, in a message you can put a command in a message. You can have REST calls um, for events like REST feeds um, or for command. It's not connected in any way. A lot of people, whenever I say command-driven communication, they, they think of, oh, synchronous REST again, and that's exactly not the case. It's just like the content is a command. I, want, I have an intent, right? but it still can be a message. And... Now, another misconception is like, oh, orchestration, you want to do that BPM stuff centralized. No, I'm saying orchestration, command-based communication. But because I'm in distributed systems, 
I'm not sure if payment is available the moment I call it or it's messaging. So I need to wait very often for things. And that makes this orchestration within order fulfillment stateful. And that's where um, something like BPMO workflow or orchestration engines come in. Um, just a very quick notice. I mean, I'm opinionated like every other human being. I try to make it transparent in a way. Um, I co-founded or I'm co-founded Chief Technologist of Kamunda. We're an open source process automation vendor. So I'm obviously a bit biased towards um, seeing process automation as a solution for a lot of problems, um, but I'm totally convinced that this is true. <laughs> I'm doing, or I contributed to various open source workflow engines over the last 15 years. So I, I've seen a lot um, what you can do with this kind of technology. If you want to reach out to me, if you have any questions after the talk, feel free to. To do so, there's my Twitter handle as well if you want to tweet me. I'm currently writing a book with O'Reilly, Practical Process Automation. It's in early access if you're interested in some of the content I do here. And I always search for technical reviews. So if you're interested in that, shoot me an email. Okay, but that's, so that's my opinionation. I'm thinking about problems through the lens of, yeah, workflow engines, process automation. And if you do that, a workflow engine is actually a great tool to express an orchestration here because, um, not because orchestration needs a workflow engine, but because it gets what I call long running because you need to wait for things. For example, you send out the command um, to retrieve the payment, maybe that's a message, but then you wait for the um, response, which could be a response message, which could be an event. And maybe that's happening milliseconds later, but probably also minutes or probably in hours or days if payment is a wire transfer we want to wait for, right? So um, that's, what makes a workflow engine an interesting fit in an orchestration scenario, because now we can implement the long running behavior of waiting, right? And so on and so forth. And then I'm not going into details of the tooling, but the important thing here is again, if I say workflow engine, a lot of people think of very heavyweight, big vendor, unhandy kind of tools, and that's not true anymore. There are a lot of lightweight ones. Um, we do very cool stuff, but um, there are a couple of others as well very lightweight and you can imagine it in, in a way where you say, okay, I have that process model which just expresses the, the orchestration logic, the long running logic, and then you can attach code. So for example, in order to send the command to fetch goods, there's no magic behind that. I just basically glue code there, which says, okay, whenever the process, whenever you're there, execute that code and that sends a message using whatever you do. In this case, it's break. So that's the whole idea. So it's nothing um, very, very unhandy. And then the workflow engine can do that waiting, um, scheduling, uh, escalating if you're waiting for too long and so on and so forth. Okay, that's again why it's very often a combination when you do orchestration, a workflow engine makes sense because it's long running. But now you have that place where you can understand the flow, where you can um, change the flow. In this case, I made uh, payment and fetching of goods in parallel, but I could change the sequence. So now you have that place where you can do a lot of things. Cool. Last important thought here is for me, that's domain logic. That orchestration logic is domain logic. It's, it is expressed within the microservice boundary. It's nothing central. I keep reiterating over that. It's nothing central. It's really domain logic within the boundary of the microservice. And um, probably other microservices have their own processes inside because I probably wait for the customer or whatever. Right. From the outside of the microservice, I don't see that. It's an API, retrieve payment. I have no idea how they do it. I don't care from the outside. I don't know that there is some workflow engine, them orchestration at play. Okay, cool. Um, let's dedicate the last five minutes of the talk to... Um, the important question now. So if I'm saying we have command-driven communication and event-driven communication, the important question is like, when do I use what? And that's actually not super easy. There's not a super easy rule of thumb. And what I, um, just to clear up one other conception I'm seeing regularly, once upon a time, a couple of years back, um, if you had events, and events are facts, immutable, happened in the past, it's done. I'm just telling the world. Or commands, it's an intent. I want something to happen, okay? When I want to send that over the wire, five years back, we just put it in a message with messaging. That was fine. 
If you put it on Kafka and you can do that, it's a record, that's fine. Because it's, it's kept persistent. That's why they call it record. But what I see happening is that whenever somebody talks about a Petri Kafka, most people say that's an event bus. So what I put on Kafka is an event. And now we have a clash of terms. And I see so many discussions um, where people really discussing the wrong thing for ages because the one person says event and, and means any record on Kafka and the other person mean, says events and means the content, the payload of the thing. And that's really important to distinguish, right? You can put a command on Kafka, right? Okay, I'm, yeah, leave it like that. Because otherwise you, you end up with what I call commands in disguise. Hey, the customer needs to be sent a message to confirm his address change event. Hint, please do that. It's a command. I want something to happen. That's not an event, right? And I see these kind of events very, very often. And they, they complicate things. And you get into long discussions which are really unnecessary, right? Okay. I um, have to look on the time. So for me, in order to make that distinction, is it command-driven, is it event-driven? Um, one way to look at it is, is really like... Um, the direction of the dependency. That's the typical discussion around coupling. Hey, is an event-driven super decoupled? Is an orchestration super coupled? Um, no, both is coupling. I mean, if I emit an event and somebody else listens to it, the sender of the event doesn't know anything about the recipient, but the recipient knows which event it listens to. So the coupling is on the receiving side of things. If you do command-driven communication, it's the exact opposite. Payment doesn't know anything what's, who's the client calling it. Right? But the client knows which command API it uses, so the coupling is on the, on the calling side. So it's, it's just on the other side, and there's not a general rule which is better. It really depends on the situation at hand, which is better. Okay. Uh, one example I came across, which I like very much, was the... Um, the team there, they, they've built kind of a document management system. And they, they did domain-driven design. They had these contexts like, hey, we have the document, the page, and whatever. And then they've built an authorization service. And what they ended up with in the beginning was that they had a lot of events flowing around, like, hey, there was a new page. Um, hey, there was a new document. And they had to react to all of these events in the authorization service to, to create the right authorization entries. And they ended up with... Um, what's known as a distributed monolith. Every time they had a change here, they also had a change in the authorization service, which is not architecturally wise, not a good place to be in. So they, they switched that towards having a command driven API saying, hey, okay, the context does everything internally and then they let the authorization service know what to add. And now they, they had a very stable authorization service and they had local changes. So that's a beneficial situation here. In another way to look at that is also the, again, responsibility. I find that very important and a good thought. So just give you one example. Um, let's assume you have within our order fulfillment, um, you want to send notifications like, hey, we received your order. Right? That could be an event like we had in the beginning. That might be beneficial because then I can um, implement all the order notification uh, logic in one place. But if you do like financial products, for example, you might have legal obligations to send certain documents at the right moment in time. And you make, have to make sure they are sent and you probably even have to document that. Otherwise, people can sue you, right? And in this case, it's, it's not really working with, I am emitting an event. I have no idea what happens with that event. You want the notification to be sent at exactly, precisely the right moment. And that's a command driven API because now you can, you have control over it. You don't want to be responsible for something you can't control. That's for me an important thought. Um, I also like looking at that example, by the way. So you probably know the book from Sam Newman about microservices and he makes a case for choreography and says, okay, if there's a customer created and probably the loyalty points um, bank service should subscribe to that because then you don't have to call it actively and so on and so forth. And I do agree. So event-driven coupling might be um, nicer in that case because the customer creation is not responsible for loyalty at all. It's the loyalty bank thing. 
But if you look at the end-to-end -end customer onboarding flow, loyalty banks is at the very end. But I would see faces in that process, like, for example, checking um, the address or doing a credit check or scoring. That's the responsibility of onboarding. And if you onboard a customer that can't pay his bill later on, like the person responsible for this process will be approached, right? And they can't say, oh, but we send an event. They, they are accountable for that. So that's typically a mix of having some things that are orchestrated and some things that are curved. And it's always a mix. And the, the hard part is that, and I always have that sign next to my monitor here, it depends. The hard part is really, um, it, you have to look at every communication link. It's not an either or. You can't build a, we build a choreographed system. No, we build an orchestrated system. You will have both communication styles if you do a good architecture because you really need to, to balance both. I, I made that picture once, like orchestration and choreography. And all the microservices, they're intentionally round and stacked. <laughs> and I mean, if you, if you don't balance that out, you will either end up in the chaos bucket. And that's what I'm currently seeing. People are doing too much choreography and then they end up in the chaos bucket. And they do that because like five or 10 years back, um, the industry did too much orchestration, too centralized orchestration and ended up in kind of the monolithic bucket where they don't want to be. So you need to balance that. And that's what I'm trying to get at in that talk. So quick summary, orchestration is not central. <laughs> choreography is not decoupled. For me, orchestration is command-driven, choreography is event-driven. Both is coupled. It's about the direction of dependency. It's about responsibility. Um, and you need to decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. And that probably means thinking about that a bit more. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> and yeah, I think that gives us a bit of time to go in the Q&A.